Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Thea Lee. I'm president of the Economic Policy Institute, and I am delighted to welcome all of you to today's webinar on unequal power, how unequal power sabotages workers' ability to protect themselves from injury, illness, and death on the job. This event is being recorded, will be available on the EPI's website after the facts if you want to send other folks here. So today's event is part of a three-year interdisciplinary project at EPI, which is spearheaded by uh, senior economist, former president of EPI, Larry Michelle. And our focus is on the inherent asymmetry of power in the foundational labor market relationship between workers and employers. And contrary to what we sometimes call Econ 101 thinking, workers and employers do not meet in the labor market as equals, but we have imbalances of information, wealth, and institutional frameworks which contribute to lopsided bargaining power for employers. We wanna thank the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Bernard and Ann Spitzer Charitable Trust, and the Nick and Leslie Hanauer Foundation for their generous support of this work. And I invite all of you to go check out the website for the project where we are posting the papers. It is epi.org slash unequal power. And today's focus, we're really excited about the conversation today because this occurred to us early in the pandemic is that the kind of, uh, Un unequal um, access to safety and health on the job was a, a, a really important part of how we think about unequal power in the labor market. That the fact that workers do not always have the wherewithal, the ability to walk away from an unsafe job tells us a lot about what, um, what's wrong with the assumption of equal power in labor markets. We are very happy to have with us today Bernice Yearn, investigative journalist with ProPublica, where she covers labor and employment issues. Uh, Bernice. Over to you. Thank you so much, Thea. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from the panelists today who are all experts on issues related to workplace health and safety and who have identified some longstanding systemic challenges to how we are able to protect workers on the job and which the pandemic has only helped further expose. So we'll hear first from Peter Dorman and Les Bowden on the myth of wage compensation for hazardous work. Peter is an emeritus professor of political economy at Evergreen State College, and Les is a professor of environmental health at Boston University. Then we'll hear from Ann Rosenthal, former associate solicitor for occupational safety and health at the US Department of Labor. And she will discuss how workers lack of power harms their health and safety. And finally, we'll hear from Randy Rabinowitz, Executive Director of the OSH Law Project with her responses to both of these topics. Peter, you're up first. Thank you, Bernice. <clears throat> you know, there's a common sense view of occupational health and safety, which says that um, work needs to be regulated, that if uh, the, the regulators are not on the job, if, uh, uh, if employers have a free hand in setting up work any, any way they want, a lot of jobs are simply going to be very unsafe, unhealthy, um, so we, we have to avoid that. Most people would probably agree. However, a view has arisen in recent decades that takes uh, almost a diametrically opposite view. It says, really, health and safety on the job is not a problem. Workers voluntarily accept these risks. They're compensated uh, for taking them. Uh, so really, not, there's no need to have any public policy uh, about health and safety. Um, this counterintuitive view has become very influential um, in the law and economics movement, uh, at conservative think tanks, uh, and even in mainstream policy analysis, as we'll discuss shortly. That's why we had to write a paper that explained what's wrong with this view and why that matters. The view that we're referring to comes out of what Thea called the Econ 101 uh, perspective, which we also call freedom of contract view. Um, looking backward to the first half of the 19th century when that was the legal doctrine in England, and then for the first three decades or so of the 20th century when that was a highly influential view uh, in the courts in the US. Uh, the idea that um, uh, the government should stand aside, let private parties come to whatever agreements they want, uh, nothing should be prohibited or required, and the government's only job is to enforce whatever contracts uh, eventuate. Uh, 
Um, this is this econ 101 point of view is one that may be familiar to most of you. It's uh, supply and demand. You've got lots of workers. You've got lots of jobs. They come together. The supply and demand curves cross. Uh, equilibrium. Uh, no unemployment uh, in this world. Uh, there's no time that transpires. Uh, everything occurs in just a, a an instantaneous moment when contracts are agreed upon and that determines everything. Um, and power in such a world uh, simply doesn't exist. There, there is no power, it isn't defined. Um, counterpose to that, you could uh, call our view a realistic view in which employment is a relationship and not just a contract. It occurs over time and involves the way the different parties uh, behave with respect to each other. Um, Contracts are always incomplete. That is, uh, nobody could write a document that specifies every condition that's going to arise at work and tell, tell the parties what they're, they're supposed to do. And furthermore, work is interdependent. What I agree to really depends on what other people are going to be doing. We, we interact at the workplace. And so one by one contracting isn't going to work. That's why we have management in firms. Uh, and because we have management, what workers actually do is they sell their subordination. They, sub they sell their willingness to adhere to, to management. Now, this is not a complete subordination. Workers can quit, but quitting is very expensive and workers put up with a lot before they'll leave a job. Um, the major restriction on what involve, what the subordination entails is regulation. Employment is a legal status in every, uh, in really in every developed country. Uh, it is regulated, there are certain things one can do, one cannot do, and that extends also to occupational safety and health. So power is built into the situation. It's not an extraneous factor, it's, it's integral to the employment relationship. <clears throat> so occupational safety and health has been regulated in one form or another in the English speaking world since the Middle Ages, going back to the old law of masters and servants. Um, it was regulated uh, because of an awareness that if it weren't, um, in those areas where it's not regulated, those occupations or industries or regions, uh, workers can face barbaric conditions. Um, and so regulation is intended to, to avoid that. Sometimes the regulation has been stronger or weaker, but there's always been some regulation. Um, now, the, the other view, on the other hand, uh, this um, this uh, freedom of contract view, the Econ 101 view, is that uh, this regulation was really a mistake from the beginning because workers uh, are rational people. They come together uh, with employers. They, in, when they uh, make their contracts, uh, some workers choose to take more dangerous jobs. They are rewarded for that with more money. So they're trading off safety for money. Um, and that results in this lovely world of, of their imagination uh, in which um, employers, by trying to avoid making those extra payments to workers, have efficient incentives to make work safe. And that regulation can only interfere with those incentives and make it worse. Uh, there's no particular inequality. You don't have to worry about workers in unsafe jobs. They're just as well off as anyone else because they're getting more money for taking on this risk. Uh, and finally, you can look at how much money workers are said to get for their extra risk and look at the extra risk and from that extrapolate to a monetary value of life. And then you can take that value and plug it in wherever you want. Economists are, are really keen on, on having that ability. Well, what did we learn from the pandemic? The pandemic, which is ongoing, of course, is, is a natural experiment, if you, if you will. Jobs that had previously been relatively safe have become very dangerous. And some jobs that were somewhat dangerous have become extremely dangerous. So there's been this huge change in the distribution and level of risk. And if the uh, freedom of contract people were correct, what we would expect to see is, first of all, lots of hazard pay, especially in those occupations like, like meat processing and seafood processing and so on, where, where uh, the risk of contagion is very high, you would expect to see very high payments to those workers. And because of that, you would also expect to see employers taking extreme measures to protect their workers from uh, the risk of exposure. 
Um, what we've seen is exactly the opposite. There's been a, there was a bit of hazard pay at the beginning as some of the branded retailers and so on tried to uh, appeal to the public uh, sense of fairness, uh, but rather quickly, even as the pandemic was gathering speed, that hazard pay dried up. Um, now, in the face of, of, of just the implausibility of their argument, how do the proponents of this hazard pay um, Econ 101 view of the world uh, justify themselves? And the answer is they've been uh, cranking out an a large number of statistical studies that claim to identify the compensation that workers get. And so a large part of our paper is taken up with detailed criticism of these studies. Uh, we show that there's massive data error uh, that goes into it, that the, what they claim to measure, they're not even remotely measuring. And we also identify a large number of statistical flaws, which uh, which render these studies uh, even, even more implausible. Um, finally, we show that even, even in spite of that, there's a pattern that emerges from their studies themselves, which shows that the more power you have in the labor market, the more likely you are in their work uh, to get wage compensation for risk. Uh, this shows up in black workers versus white workers, immigrant workers versus native, union versus non-union, lower paid workers versus higher paid workers. It's a, it's a pattern over all of this. And so even as their work is, is highly flawed, uh, nevertheless, even on its own terms, it supports a power matters view of the labor market. Now, unfortunately, the prominence of this view has resulted in blockage of critical legislation uh, and regulation uh, for years, uh, strengthening OSHA, which needs to be done, uh, much better implementation, uh, uh, extension of regulation, especially to the, the current pandemic situation. This has had really serious consequences over the years for the labor force. And to tell us more about that, I'll turn the mic over to, uh, to Les. Thanks, Peter. So, COVID-19 has highlighted the limitations, both of worker protections and of our social security, our social safety net. Worker safety is constrained in large part because of very limited union power and very weak regulation. Uh, we've seen this for workers infected by COVID-19 and those who lost their jobs because of the pandemic, uh, but, that just highlighted a situation that's been around for a long time. Uh, could you put up a slide, please? Uh, first slide, that's the second slide, or it should be, sorry, the other slide. Thank you. So uh, one thing that we can see here is, uh, sorry, Go back to the other slide. Right. Okay, so uh, there's there's been a problem here, and I'm just going to uh, ask you to turn this off because this those are both the same slide. <laughs> uh, what you would have seen had the slide that I expected to come up uh, uh, arrive is that of all the high income countries, uh, the United States has the highest injury rate. Um, and uh, when people are injured at work, they rely on workers' compensation to cover their medical costs and lost wages. However, almost nobody with a work-related illness can get workers' comp benefits, and only about half the people who should get those benefits uh, because they're injured actually receive them. And when they do, those benefits only cover a small portion of their earnings. So we have uh, 5 million workers who are injured every year, uh, probably 25 to 50 million people who uh, actually die because of uh, work-related illness, and uh, there's no social backstop. In, in addition, uh, and now we could put up the slide, thank you. Um, work-related injury and disability are very unequally distributed by race and ethnicity. Uh, the burden of work-related disability 
falls most heavily on workers of color and their families. Is that slide coming? Uh, again, if this, what you'll be able to see when the slide comes up is that if you look at older black workers, they have about 75% higher rates of work-related disability uh, than do their white counterparts. And these are directly tied uh, to differences in the hazardousness of their jobs and thereby to labor market discrimination. Um, as Peter described, the myth of hazard wages has stood for too long as an argument against increased health and safety regulation and against better social insurance system in a world of increasing power disparities. Uh, the time for change is now. So you can see here uh, the huge disparity in the maroon uh, bar uh, between the rate of disability for white uh, workers uh, and those of, uh, of black and uh, other uh, minority workers. Uh, sorry, uh, that's, uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much, Peter and Les. Um, Anne Rosenthal will be next. She'll be speaking about her paper. Um, Anne, over to you. Thank you. Um, and I am going to pick up a bit from where Les and Peter were, were talking. Um, as some of you may know, may know, this is the 50th anniversary this year of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. It was signed by the president, I think it was President Nixon in December of 1970 and OSHA came into being on April 28th of 1971. So we, there will be celebrations, I guess, this year. Um, April 28th, however, is also Workers' Memorial Day and there are definitely a lot of workers who we need to remember. Um, I should add as a quick disclaimer here, some of you may know that although I was not working um, for any particular employer at the time I wrote this paper on January 20th, I became an OSHA employee. I'm a senior advisor at OSHA now. However, this paper was done before I came and the views I'm expressing today are entirely my own. They are not the views of OSHA. Um, so the OSHA Act, when it was passed, was a really revolutionary piece of, of legislation. Um, for the first time in the history of this country, although as Peter and Les pointed out, there had been some worker regulation over some kinds of employment before this, um, almost all workers were given the right to safe or at least safer working conditions. And at that time, work was very different than it is today. Most workers had a single employer who controlled all aspects of their workplaces. About a quarter of them were represented by unions and unions were a powerful part of the coalition that passed the OSH Act. And the act was not only gave employers the obligation to keep their workers safe, it was intended to give workers and their representatives more of a voice in keeping the workplaces safe. But that wasn't exactly the way it worked out. As Randy will describe in more detail, the act didn't give workers a direct voice in managing their own safety and health. What it gave them was a number of ways to ask OSHA to take enforcement action. And it gave OSHA the control over, over workplaces. And what that means is that the tools that OSHA has are pretty much the only way that most workers' safety and health is protected. The, and these tools can be very powerful. They have resulted in some major improvements in worker health and safety. Far fewer workers now than in years past develop asbestosis or lead poisoning. There are many fewer grain elevator explosions than used to occur. But the nature of work itself has changed drastically over the last half century. OSHA's capabilities are limited and there are structural deficiencies in the act and in the federal regulatory ecosystem in which it exists that prevent OSHA from achieving as much as its advocates had hoped. In my paper, I describe several ways in which these factors um, affect workers, show workers lack of power over their health and safety, and in some cases over their own lives. Um, I'll talk about a couple of them here because they have become sharply and tragically evident during the last year 
when the combination of a deadly pandemic and an administration uncommitted to using OSHA's most effective tools led to thousands of workers contracting COVID-19 and losing their lives, um, as I think Peter had mentioned earlier. Um, fairly early in the pandemic, we all knew the basic tools needed to protect people, including workers. Basically, people should stop breathing each other's ear. It's pretty simple. There are a number of ways to do this. People should stay apart. Six feet is the most common recommendation, but you know, sometimes it should be more. Um, they should wear masks so that asymptomatic people who don't know that they're sick or don't know that they're sick yet um, won't be exhaling virus particles into others' breathing zones. People should wash their hands frequently. Building owners and other people who control buildings should pay attention to ventilation because better ventilated places are safer um, or they should be outdoors. Um, and people who are contagious or are likely to be contagious shouldn't be around others. So you shouldn't have systems at work where people are incentivized to come in even when they're sick. And finally, healthcare workers who do need to care for infected patients should be provided with appropriate personal protective equipment. And one of the um, real benefits of, of this pandemic is that now everybody knows what PPE is. So I no longer have to explain that every time I say it. Um, and workers knew this, they wanted these protections and the act provided them with two ways to get them. First, they could complain to OSHA about the conditions at their workplaces. Sorry, my dog just came in, so you're going to hear some barking for a minute or two. Um, they could complain to OSHA about conditions at their workplaces and ask for an inspection. The act says that if a worker files a or worker rep files a formal complaint, that is a complaint that is signed by a worker or a worker representative, um, then OSHA has to go to the workplace and do it and do an inspection. And if a worker is retaliated against for complaining either to OSHA or to its employer, or in some cases to the press, um, then the worker can also file a complaint with OSHA and can um, have any discipline that it suffered reversed, or at least that's the way it's supposed to work. OSHA could have taken a lot of actions to help protect workers, but it didn't do that. Um, Despite its general duty clause, which prohibits employers from exposing their workers to conditions, um, to recognized hazards that can cause death or serious physical harm, OSHA took no enforcement actions in the first six months of, of the pandemic. It did not respond to most worker complaints. Those that it did respond to were only in healthcare settings. Um, it, in fact, in one case um, that I did a little bit of work on, a, an OSHA um, official said in a hearing in federal district court that no, OSHA had determined that there were no imminent dangers of COVID exposure outside of healthcare. Um, what OSHA did do during that time was issue a lot of guidance documents that basically tracked CDC guidance and told workers what they told employers what they should be doing, but it made clear that they did not have to do that. Um, so, when, and when OSHA finally did start enforcing, predictably, most of its citations were directed at healthcare facilities that didn't provide staff with adequate PPE. Um, it issued during 2020 only two general duty clause violations. Um, the PPE violations were important. I don't want to minimize them, but they certainly weren't the only violations of the OSHA Act that could have been cited. And what also happened to many workers who tried to help themselves either through complaining to OSHA, to their employers, in some cases to the press. Um, one worker that I, I mentioned in the paper just was a doctor and just issued a plea for more PPE and was promptly fired. These, um, over the course of 2020, OSHA received almost 4,000 complaints of this kind of retaliation. And that was a number that just completely overwhelmed it. Um, OSHA didn't have the resources to deal with those. It did start investigating some of them, but most of them are, are just still pending. Um, the other problem that OSHA had, the, the lack of political will that was affecting its ability to, or its, well, yeah, its ability, because the 
career staff at OSHA was trying really hard to perform its protected purpose, um, but it was stretched. It, OSHA had the lowest number of inspectors it had ever had in its history. Um, it had way too few whistleblower investigators to respond to these, to these cases, and it just nothing happened. Um, so, so that's that is one of the the ways in which we can we can see that it that the act did not fully empower workers. I have lost track of time here, um, but there have been successes. Some of the biggest ones involve OSHA's ability to enact health standards. Um, when Congress passed the act, though, it anticipated OSHA promulgating them pretty quickly. One of my favorite quotes um, is when comes from OSHA's first, a, a challenge to OSHA's first asbestos standard in which a court said, um, well, what do you mean OSHA didn't do an adequate job of explaining the standard? There are, I think it was four or maybe six closely spaced federal register pages explaining the standard. And what else could we possibly expect it to do? Well, compare that to one of OSHA's more recent standards, the silica standard that was promulgated in 2016 with 600 closely spaced federal register pages defending it. It's, it's a good standard. It has been upheld in court, um, but it took, depending on how one does the counting, anywhere from nine or to 80 years to promulgate that standard. Um, nine years from the time OSHA started working really intensively on it, um, 50 years from the time that OSHA first said it was going to regulate silica, and 80 years from the time that uh, Francis Perkins, one of the greatest labor secretaries, announced that we had to stop workers from getting silicosis. So this is obviously not a system that can respond effectively to all of the hazards that workers face. Um, and I think, given the time, that's about where I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Anne. Next, we're going to turn. We're going to turn to Randy, who I uh, will share some thoughts on on both of those topics for us. So in my view, both papers highlight a key flaw in federal health and safety regulation. And I think uh, that flaw is that the scheme relies far too heavily on government to protect workers and far too little on empowering workers to protect themselves. Uh, furthermore, paltry penalties under the OSHA Act and state workers' comp laws tend to insulate employers from bearing the full cost of workplace injuries, uh, both mean that it's often cheaper for employers to ignore health and safety hazards than it is to invest in prevention. And that's a serious problem. The OSHA Act gives workers some rights to complain to OSHA, to point out hazards to inspectors, to participate in settlements and other efforts to secure abatement and to be free from retaliation. But as a practical matter, unions have some ability to enforce these rights in unionized workplace, individual employees have virtually no ability to exercise these rights effectively in non-union workplaces. Several examples might highlight the problem. While workers can complain to OSHA about hazards and seek an inspection, employers often fire workers who do so. OSHA rarely files suit to protest retaliation. And as we learned in COVID, OSHA doesn't, can't, doesn't have to conduct a physical inspection in response to a complaint if it doesn't want to. And when they don't do so, o workers have virtually no recourse. OSHA is also supposed to consult workers during an inspection and allow them to participate in walk around and consult with them before settling a citation. In many union workplaces, OSHA does but not always. In non-union workplaces, it almost never does. Employees vir virtually have no participation rights if they don't have a union. It's entirely up to OSHA how whether these rights are enforced or not. So the system leaves little room for workers to engage in self-help and instead if empowering workers to take action to protect themselves, it relies too heavily on OSHA, an underfunded, slow to respond, fair weather friend. 
This lack of worker empowerment stands in sharp contrast to other employment and environmental laws. Title VII, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and ERISA all permit employees to file suit to affect to enforce their rights under those laws. Environmental laws per, permit citizens to enforce their provisions as well. OSHA does not. Bottom line here is that when a sympathetic administration runs OSHA, it can help workers gain greater bargaining power over health and safety problems, although it's always constrained by legal, political, and budgetary limitations. But when an unsympathetic administration runs OSHA, as we saw in COVID, workers can't do anything to protect themselves, and the government just sat idly by. The economics of health and safety actually exacerbate this problem. The current health and safety regime shields employers from bearing the full cost of the health and safety hazards employees face or the injuries that they suffer. When OSHA issues citations, the penalties it assesses rarely come close to imposing real economic costs on employers. And employers usually pay only a fraction of the penalty OSHA proposes. So OSHA imposes little economic deterrent on employers to health and safety violations. Criminal prosecutions for killing or maiming workers are rare. When they occur, court decisions shield individual man managers from any prosecution. Employers are also shielded by workers' compensation laws from paying the full cost of work-related injuries and barely pay anything for work-related illnesses. The basic bargain justifying workers' comp law compensation laws was that employees would receive quick, no-fault compensation for work-related injuries and illnesses in exchange for giving up their right to sue. However, procedural hurdles imposed on workers' comp recovery and limitations on what it covers means that in contested cases, compensation is rarely quick and by design does not fully compensate workers. Add to that the fact that many injuries and illnesses do not comp qualify for workers' compensation and states have refused by because states have refused to extend laws to many work-related injuries such as repetitive motion disorders or hearing loss. And even when compensation is available in theory, proving work-relatedness in practice is often very difficult. COVID is another example of that. Uh, proving that you got it at work as opposed to from your family or in a community setting is very difficult. The burden is on the employee to do so. So for not all injuries are compensated and virtually no illness, no work-related illnesses are compensated, particularly chronic illnesses such as silicosis or other respiratory ailments. Workers can't sue their employers to recover for injuries that go uncompensated because workers' comp shields them from lawsuits. If liability is imposed, it is usually imposed on product manufacturers and not on employers who are in the position to prevent the safety and health hazards. As a result, employers have, as economists like to say, externalized much of the cost of work-related illnesses and injuries. As a result, society as a whole or workers and their families individually bear a large share of the costs of safety and health failures. Federal statutes like OSHA, workers' comp, and other statutory and legal policies limit workers' ability to effectively bargain for safety and health improvements, and this is particularly so in non-union settings. Limited social mobility for low-wage workers makes this problem substantially worse. Until that changes, there is little pressure or economic incentive for employers to invest meaningfully in health and safety protections. And in my view, that's a shame. Thanks. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, given us a lot to think about. Um, and I wanted to spend a couple minutes just reflecting on what we've heard so far. Um, I spent the last year, the bulk of it, covering COVID in the workplace along with my colleague, uh, Michael Graybell. And we spent several months looking specifically at what was happening at meatpacking plants, which of course experienced some of the largest workplace outbreaks during the pandemic. Um, 
And what the panelists have described resonates deeply with what we were hearing from workers about the challenges that they had in weighing their concerns about getting sick versus their need to earn a living. But interesting when, when, interestingly, when they're describing their experience at work, it was rarely framed in the terminology of unequal power per se. Instead, what uh, they often described was a feeling of a lack of agency or choice um, when something was not right in their workplace, whether it was how close they had to work to their coworkers on the line or whether they were uh, given insufficient PPE. And a lot of that was based on the simple fact that they needed to pay their bills and feed their families. Um, and that's something that I've heard over the years, whether it's meatpacking workers, farm workers, night shift janitors, I've come to hear how complex the financial calculation is for many workers. And, you know, they're worried that when complaining about the problem that they're seeing at their workplace, they feel disposable, that they needed to find a way to keep their job. If they summon the courage to make a complaint, they didn't feel confident that their complaints would lead to a meaningful response. So they might as well soldier on and not make waves. Uh, in the worst case scenarios, they worried that they'd face retaliation. You know, among the meatpacking workers during COVID, we heard that one of the biggest stumbling blocks to staying safe was the lack of paid sick leave and strict attendance policies, the so-called point system, where a missing a day for any reason, no matter how legitimate or how necessary, led to a point, and after so many points, you were out, end of story. And these workers had been trained also to work through pain caused by repetitive stress injuries and using sharp knives. So they had been taught to come into work no matter what. When COVID hit, they were part of an industry culture that had told them to keep working at all costs. And they either couldn't or didn't know that they could take up time off uh, if they or their loved ones were sick. Sadly, one of the workers that we met, um, uh, or I'm sorry, one of the workers that we profiled was a woman named Felicia Joseph, who died on the way to the hospital after battling COVID-19. She was a Haitian immigrant working at a Tyson pork plant in Waterloo, Iowa. Last April, she started to feel ill and her friend tried to convince her to skip a shift and go see a doctor. Uh, but Joseph said she felt pressured to go to work. She was supporting 10 relatives back at home in Haiti. And her friend also told us that Felicia kept saying that her boss was coughing, but her boss was still coming to work so that if she stayed home, she was definitely gonna lose her job. We would later find out that this was the plant where the management was allegedly taking winner take all bets on how many workers would get sick with COVID. Clearly, it's a confluence of problems that's led to tens of thousands of meatpacking workers um, to get sick and, and hundreds to die uh, from COVID. On top of not feeling like they had the ability to take time off, they faced particular risks because of how closely they were spaced on the line. Um, and this was combined with uneven and sometimes slow response by the meatpacking companies to put safeguards in place, even though, as um, our reporting showed, essential businesses like meatpacking plants had been warned about this scenario for more than a decade. Meanwhile, as Anne and Randy have pointed out, OSHA did not prioritize these workers in its COVID-19 enforcement. So the end result was that some workers went to work terrified or even after they got sick because they didn't want to get fired. And for the workers I've spoken with, with once again, paying the bills was a critical part of the calculation when, when they were thinking about what they were willing to tolerate when it came to health and safety hazards on the job. And it was interesting to read Peter and Les's paper because despite the risks and hazards associated with meatpacking, and yes, it does pay more than the minimum wage, so often these jobs were taken out of necessity. We heard from so many workers that they took these jobs because they can be done if you don't have formal education or the ability to speak English. Reporting on the pandemic in meatpacking has also been so instructive on the question of unequal power because it's an industry that has seen such a dramatic rise and fall in worker power. As part of our reporting on meatpacking and COVID, Michael Graybell and I spent some time in Waterloo, Iowa to document what had happened there as a result of the cases associated with the Tyson plant. And that's how we came to know Felicia Joseph, who I mentioned a moment ago. Um, and meatpacking workers as well from all corners of the city who had been affected by COVID-19 from Bosnian to Kareni refugees to Latino immigrants. All of which was such a stark contrast to what things looked like several decades ago. Back in the late 1940s through the 1960s, meatpacking was a path to the middle class for both black and white workers. And Waterloo was home to a fiery meatpackers union, the United Packing House Workers of America Local 46, that could demand the equivalent of $24 to $32 an hour in today's wages back in those days. 
I spoke to one of Local 46's former union stewards, John Carr, who's now in his 80s, and he remembered a time when he could walk through the plant and command a work stoppage by simply throwing down a handkerchief. And when we talked, he lamented the lack of solidarity among workers these days and the fact that workers today don't realize how much the companies actually need them. Things have changed a lot since Mr. Carr worked in meatpacking, and I marvel at how different Mr. Carr's experience is from that of E. May, a refugee from Burma who we met, whose entire family works at the Tyson plant in Waterloo. She has had to argue with management to let her father use the bathroom during a shift. She once collapsed on the line. And even though she was terrified for her family who had to go to the pork plant during the pandemic, and by the way, everyone in her family did end up getting COVID and very sadly, her grandfather died from it. But she resigned, she was absolutely resigned about the fact that her family simply had to accept the risk. As she put it, if the plant is running, you have to go. So all of this leads me uh, to some questions that I have for the panelists. Um, the first one being, what would it take at a policy level for workers to feel empowered, for, for more workers to feel like Mr. Carr, uh, so that they're able to demand and maintain safe workplaces? Randy, I don't know, we, uh, perhaps we can start with you. Um, well, I would say first and foremost, there should be an effective way for people to complain and to know that if they're fired or discharged or retaliated in any way, they have a real and meaningful remedy in the short term. They shouldn't have to wait five years to see if they get some compensation <laughs> or something. They should also be able to complain about health and safety hazards. And if they're not fixed, they should be able to do something about it, whether or not OSHA backs them up. I mean, it's just too inadequate for people to have to rely on an agency that is stretched so thin. And one thing that neither Anne and I mentioned is even when OSHA issues citations, employers are not required to fix the problem until they're done litigating over whether they are responsible for it. So it can take years even when OSHA issues a citation, assesses a penalty, it can take years before a problem is fixed. So workers are left with the notion that what point, what's the point of risking my job when nothing's going to change? And so there should be some real time response to complaints about real hazards. Now, not every complaint is valid, but many of them are. Would it take, could, could, could it be done through rulemaking or would we need new legislation? How could we approach some of those? Um, we probably need new legislation. Uh, certainly on the retaliation end, there have been proposals in Congress for many years to strengthen the anti-retaliation provisions of the OSHA Act and they have not passed. Some more recent uh, statutes contain much more aggressive pro-worker anti-retaliation provisions. OSHA enforces many of them, but almost all of them give employees the right to go to court on their own. So just an example I often cite, and I don't mean to minimize the harms that come from sexual harassment or other kinds of uh, workplace harassment, but those get a lot of publicity. And if an employer allows harassment to go on in its workplace, uh, they get penalized and they can get penalized severely. You can kill a dozen workers and OSHA might only assess a penalty of a couple thousand dollars. And that just seems out of balance to me. And I think uh, has some, some thoughts okay, to share. Sorry, I, I completely second everything that Randy said. I would also add that there is not the same public outrage at the way workers are treated, the workers subject to OSHA as there is about others. Um, I started my career working as a lawyer for MSHA, the Mine Safety and Health Administration. And there is a romance to miners, something. Every time there is a mine disaster, there is a stronger law passed. Um, that doesn't happen under OSHA. You know, when we had the BP explosion, the Imperial Sugar explosion, I mean, dozens of workers are killed and nothing happens. Um, we just spend years trying to litigate with the employers and, and nobody seems to feel the same sense of outrage 
that they do when a mine explodes. When the, the most recent was the um, explosion at the West Fertilizer Plant in Texas a few years ago. And that was outrageous. And there were 15 firefighters that were killed. Not all of them were subject to OSHA because most of them were volunteer firefighters. But, you know, they, all that we were faced with was, well, this is a small employer. You can't do that much to affect this small employer. And, you know, we, we did what we could, but it is, there is some reason. Um, OSHA penalties are so low by comparison to penalties for um, environmental violations. And some of the, the few cases where we've had effective criminal prosecutions involved cases where as well as an employer's actions harming workers, they also either resulted in fish being killed in the case called Atlantic Pipe. And so there could be an environmental prosecution for that. Um, one of the stories that I think most drastically illustrates the values of this country that I find completely unacceptable is after the BP explosion in 2005 in which 15 workers were killed. Um, over the next several years, there were enforcement actions from OSHA, from EPA, and from the SEC. In the end, BP paid a penalty of $500 million to the SEC because it hadn't adequately informed its stockholders of the hazards of this plant. It paid a $50 million penalty to EPA because it had made the air over Houston a little bit more polluted for a couple of days. OSHA was eventually able to collect a $21 million penalty, but that was the largest OSHA had ever, ever assessed in its history. And that was for 15 workers who died. I mean, it just, I, I find the value system embodied in that comparison to be so completely backwards. Um, but it, you did ask what it would mean for workers to have a sense of agency. And I think the, the first thing that would take would be for us to have better, a better system of union. I mean, they, if the workers had unions, they would have more agency, at least if they, if they had powerful enough unions. Um, but you know, we have a country, we all just watched what happened at Amazon where employers have all the power in the world to intimidate their workers and to terrify them, and to, to make them absolutely terrified that if they voted for union representation, their lives would be even worse. And, you know, we need, we need a, a better system. And I, I don't know exactly what it is, but the priorities and the values seem so inverted to me. Thanks, Anne. You know, I wanted to ask Peter and Les, I mean, um, you know, given that the kind of the Econ 101 point of view has uh, arisen and, and has been influential in policy, I, I was hoping you could spell out the ways that it has been influential and, and ways that you see that it could possibly be the uh, uh, question or, or that there will be ways to kind of counteract those types of policies. Maybe I can, I can begin and, and Les can pick it up. Um, you know, we, Les and I are not the only two uh, economists who have problems with this uh, uh, Econ 101 view. Um, on the contrary, most fairly sophisticated economists who study labor and health issues think it's crazy, this, uh, this idea that workers are compensated and uh, there's no need for regulation and so on. Um, uh, in the paper, I mentioned, for instance, that the leading textbook in labor economics, which is used at the highest ranked uh, graduate programs in the country, has almost a, an entire chapter devoted to criticizing the kind of work that uh, we are also criticizing. Now, you might wonder, well, so what? Like, what, how does this come to be? Uh, and of course, part of the answer is, well, Econ 101 has become an ideology, which is very useful uh, for certain interests in the country. And, um, and so they promulgate this very simplistic point of view uh, for their own ends. But there's another angle to it, which is, which is the more you look at it, it gets even weirder. And that is that um, 
policy people and economists, not all of them, but, but some of them want to be able to put a price on everything. They want to be able to do cost benefit analysis. They want a social cost of carbon. They want to be perceived as hard headed policy people. And so they want to have prices for everything. And of course, a lot of regulation involves uh, longevity and risks to people's life and health. So you, if you believe that you need a price for everything, you need a price for that. Well, along come these people who say, hey, the labor market works great, you know, workers are compensated, and you can use this to come up with a dollar value of what a life is worth. Uh, and they do, and it's like eight, nine million dollars um, is, is the price tag for, for the average life, according to these studies. Um, and because of the strong demand for those, that number, the whole baggage of all this stuff, the ideological baggage, the terrible you know, analysis that's done, the, the terrible policy implications of it, it just follows right along and it gets accepted. The one little tip that I'd like to leave you with, in addition to everything else people have said about the inadequacies of, inadequacies of existing regulation, OSHA itself uses these value of life calculations for its own analysis of its own regulations. And these are analyses that are based on the assumption that workers freely choose the risks they face on the job. If, if that were true, you wouldn't need any policies of, against retaliation because there would be no power of retaliation. Workers would just say, oh, I don't like this job so much. I'll take another job, it's just as good. Um, that's the assumption behind this, this, these studies, and OSHA itself uses these, these numbers. Um, so we're up, against, we're up against a whole culture of policy analysis, um, which sweeps along in its, in its wake this, this really crazy idea about workers voluntarily choosing their level of risk. Um, can I jump in on, on that for one minute, having spent more than 30 years doing OSHA rulemaking? Um, I, I don't know, the um, OMB, OIRA rules require OSHA to use these value of a statistical life um, computations in doing its own analyses. Um, OSHA itself does not use cost benefit analysis to promulgate rules because the Supreme Court has said that's not the appropriate thing for OSHA to do. So I, I, I do want to take OSHA a little bit off the hook there. I will also add there is one slight benefit to those, which is that it sometimes makes it easier for OSHA to justify the rules because the value of a statistical life, while it's it's totally abhorrent in human view, you know, in, in terms of human values to start saying, well, this life is worth, I think the current valuation is $11 million. Um, it does make it easier to show that the um, benefits of any given worker protection rule greatly outweigh its costs, which, which is helpful. So not that it's the appropriate analysis, it's just sometimes a useful one. So um, I'm uh, probably going to disagree a little with Peter in a certain way. But before I do that, I just want to thank you, Bernice, and your colleagues for the wonderful work that you've done at ProPublica over the last years. Uh, thank you. Now, back to that question. I think that economists who sort of follow this particular way of thinking and analyzing things uh, don't really drive anything in the real world. I think they get used by people who have power uh, and that there has been a, a decades long, uh, uh, what shall I call it, a, a decades long attempt by people who don't want to see workers and unions have power to change our laws, to change our institutions, to reduce and minimize the power that, that workers have. Uh, OSHA is a wonderful thing, but it, it can't, you know, get there to be safety in all the um, 
workplaces in the United States. And it really requires the kind of power that you talked about with the Meatpackers Union back decades ago and the kinds of laws that enable that kind of worker uh, agency to happen. And that's a political task. Um, and it's probably not a political task that gets accomplished in a few short years. But I think that's the only way to get the kinds of changes that, uh, that we need to have. Thanks to everyone for, for their responses. I, um, I wanted to ask also, we're going to turn to some questions from the audience shortly, but um, since I know this is a topic that uh, everyone is concerned about, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about what your thoughts are and about the inadequacies of the data, um, you know, especially when it comes to how they're being used in, in say those wage risk studies, Peter and Les, and then also um, illness and injury reporting. Um, and, and how that affects, uh, again, what OSHA is able to do uh, and, and what's happening to workers and their ability to seek recourse. Okay, I'll start this off, but I know that Les has some very useful things to say about this too. Um, well, one way to begin is to say there's three kinds of risks workers face on the job. There's, um, well, there are two big kinds, if you will, and they're subdivided. One is uh, the risk of an accident, uh, traumatic injury, uh, and the other is risk of a disease. And the injuries themselves can either be fatal or non-fatal as the diseases can be. Now, the reality is in America, and Les will talk about this much more, we have a terrible system of surveillance and reporting on non-fatal occupational injuries. Um, I mean, it, why, how bad it is and why it's bad is really important to understand. And I. I hope Les will say a few words about this. Um, we have a fairly good reporting system on fatal uh, accidents. Um, and we have almost no knowledge or minimal knowledge of, of occupational disease um, for reasons that are both intrinsic to the, the nature of the problem, it's difficult to do, and also because of the lack of will in establishing institutions and surveillance to, uh, to get the job done. Now, in any study that purports to say what, how much workers make as a function of the risk they face on the job, you have to have a measure of risk. And so these studies mainly look at fatal occupational injuries. Now, it just happens that um, the limited information we have suggests that the number of workers who die from disease on the job is a big multiple of the number who die from injuries, um, like five to 13 times, according to one study. Um, and in that case, then, uh, the people who are studying dangerous work are actually not looking at the main source of danger at all. And there's no guarantee that the jobs that have the most accidents are the ones that have the most illnesses. On the contrary, nearly half or 40% of all fatal injuries on the job are vehicular, are people who die either driving or getting hit by a vehicle. And that's bad and it's serious and that needs to be understood, but that doesn't necessarily correspond to what we think dangerous work is necessarily or how workers would, would view it or what the priorities for regulation ought to be. So um, right there, we see a huge uh, data problem. And on top of that, um, when you look at how much people make, you've got, you're dealing with um, individual data, like individual level stuff, this person, that person. Um, at the individual level, you have no way to measure risk on the job. So what they do is they assign an average risk for that person's industry and occupation. And that's averaging over hundreds of people to assign the risk to, to, to the individual and not looking at how that risk can be very different for people, even in the same general occupation and industry categories. Um, and finally, so really think about this one, none of the studies go beyond people who work with their hands. They don't include people who work behind a desk, right? Now you think of dangerous work and pay and you're always thinking about, well, you know, what's a good job? What's the kind of job people wanna get, you know, and so on. If you eliminate all desk work from your sample right at the beginning, you're already missing the point in a way. 
about, about how people value different types of job amenities and what gets rewarded in the society. Um, it's, it's crazy. And the, the terrible thing is that these criticisms have been made for decades. Like your data are wrong. They're just not telling you what you think and they don't care. They just reproduce it over and over and over again. And then the agencies that want that value of statistical life thing go, you know, they put their stamp of approval on it and it goes down the line. And um, somehow there, there hasn't been a way yet to call them on it and say, this is crazy. You know, you're making these judgments and you have no real basis for it. Um, I, I'm not sure the best way to add to Peter's comments. I, I will say that there, uh, that although it's hard to impute chronic occupational illnesses in many cases to individuals, it's not that hard uh, and studies have been done that show where the excess risk is. Uh, but it's not generally the case that that showing of excess risk gets turned into uh, fixing a problem. And the problems are kind of, are, are really not just problems of occupational safety. They're problems having to do with the wages that people get, their problems having to do with discrimination. Um, and uh, there are even problems having to do with things like sick leave. So we have a COVID-19 epidemic and there are people in jobs, many people in dangerous jobs who don't have sick leave. So what do you do when it's a question of losing your income entirely or uh, coming to work sick? So, Bernice, I just wanted to add a non-academic but practical point, which is I think that the statistics that we do have uh, bear no relationship to what workers will tell you when you talk to them. So if you ask the workers who's been sick or injured, it's often the case that they'll tell you about lots of cases that don't appear on the official reports. <laughs> Thank you. And I mean, but that does affect how OSHA goes about its business. Yes. Uh, can you unpack that a little bit? What are what are the concerns with the, the numbers not being accurate here? Well, some of the concerns are OSHA plans inspections based on um, injury and illness statistics. They target employers using them. Uh, workers' compensation premiums are often based on reported injuries and illnesses. So if they're seriously underreported, people are not being charged appropriately for the level of uh, harm they're causing to people. Uh, those are two that come to mind pretty quickly. I'm kind of on a related note related to, uh, you know, those injuries that are not as obvious as, as say, fatalities. Um, a question from the audience is, um, how can workers be compensated for repetitive stress type injuries that might not show up for years and cannot be traced to a single on the job injury? Any thoughts from the group? Oh, uh, so that's part of an argument that says maybe for these kinds of illnesses and injuries, and maybe also for uh, COVID type injuries and illnesses, that workers comp is not the right place, that people need to have uh, uh, health insurance that's universal, that covers everybody, where their uh, health, uh, the health costs of these injuries and illnesses get paid for, and at least for chronic and hard to diagnose uh, in illnesses, uh, there ought to be uh, another system outside of workers' comp where people can get the benefits that they need. Randy, from a, you know, an attorney's point of view, uh, is there a way that you could pursue such a case? Um, so I don't handle these cases, but at least in theory, um, the last person you work for bears the responsibility. So if you've gone through five jobs that have a uh, contribute to your repetitive motion injury, at least in theory, the idea behind workers' comp is that the employer takes you as they find you. And if you already are 
um, predisposed to having repetitive injury problems or you've suffered some hearing loss, you hire someone who's in their 60s, who's been in loud manufacturing jobs for years, they're more likely to suffer a hearing detriment than a 25 year old who hasn't worked in a loud factory environment as much. And so that's supposed to be compensated, but uh, it, there's no longer uh, easy proof of causation in workers' comp. The standards have been raised, the standard of proof has been raised, and it's become more likely to be a contested case that would be difficult to prevail on. And there's often not a manufacturer in repetitive motion injuries where you could look to product liability. Like if a forklift rolls over or there's a defective product or you're talking about a chemical exposure or asbestos exposure, often there's potential liability for the uh, manufacturer. But in repetitive motion cases, that's very difficult to establish. Almost non-existent, I think. Challenging. Um, another uh, question from the audience, given all of the, the challenges and difficulties that we've raised um, around worker health and safety and, and kind of the infrastructure that we have here, are there experiences from other countries that we should adopt here, models from other countries? Um, uh, don't workers have the power to shut down dangerous jobs um, elsewhere? It's a great they question. They do in mines. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. And... Um, I think Americans in many different areas of policy look insufficiently to other countries to, uh, to learn from them. Uh, in the case of occupational safety and health, there are a number of different uh, uh, approaches that are used around the world, which we can, um, if not exactly import, at least, at least uh, learn some lessons from. One obvious one is work co works councils. Uh, we talked about the importance of unions, but one advantage of a works council is you can mandate that every workplace have a works council. And you can say that working conditions have to be part of the mandate of that works council. Um, and there's, there's a lot of experience in Europe with, uh, with these councils and uh, it's really worth looking into. I think some, um, uh, some types of, uh, of uh, hazards are, are fairly well addressed in that way. Another is much better linking of, um, of workers' comp uh, premiums to uh, inspection and to, pro and to forward-looking uh, measures of, of risk assessment as opposed to backward-looking. So not just risk, uh, not just experience rating, but actually having a system of ongoing inspections where you evaluate how well um, a, a um, an enterprise is, is uh, regulating its own risk and then you adjust its, pre its premiums accordingly. That's used in Germany, for instance, and it's pretty effective in Germany. Um, I think also in Canada and Ontario, they have something like that. Um, another, another approach we could really learn from is um, expanding um, worker participation in joint council, joint safety councils. And that, that kind of overlaps a bit with the, with the work, works council approach, um, but it, it could be used as well. Um, maybe I don't want to take up all the time, so I'll pass the mic. Um, I would just mention a couple of examples. So the, the one I'm most familiar with and seems um, most practical is the steel workers routinely uh, negotiate shutdown authority in their contracts. Uh, a lot of their master agreements in the steel industry include shutdown authority, um, other unions have negotiated that, and uh, that is an, one effective way to uh, improve safety and health. Uh, a number of states do mandate joint safety and health committees. Washington State, where Peter is, is uh, one of those states that does mandate joint health and safety committees. Uh, but the, the research is uh, that they tend to work better in union environments <laughs> and they don't tend to work very well in non-union environments. So while there are some mandates, I think it's about a dozen states that have requirements on the books for joint health and safety committees. Uh, in a non-union environment, there are some practical legal problems with some of them, but 
in the absence of an organized, trained workforce that's really empowered to exercise those rights, they don't seem to work very well. And the third thing we could do is we could have a disability insurance system that didn't depend on assigning responsibility to an individual employer. And I think a lot of European countries have uh, broader social safety nets so that uh, all kinds of disabilities receive fair compensation and you don't have to worry about proving that it came from a particular uh, incident at a particular work site. Um, thank you so much, Randy, and thanks to all of the panelists for this great discussion. I just wanted to take a moment to break in because I, I know many people are following this news very closely, but I wanted to take a moment to announce Derek Chauvin was found guilty on all counts wow. of murder. So this is um, a big moment and an important verdict that's come down. And so I just, uh, I thought we should acknowledge that even as we are in the middle of another very important conversation, but as a country, this is um, a, a key moment for all of us and it's been a long time coming. So thank you. And um, with that, hand it back to Bernice. Thank you so much. Um, uh, before we um, close here, I just wanted to, um, to pick up on that thread a little bit um, in terms of uh, OSHA, again, taking strong immediate action. Uh, there's a question from the audience about, um, you know, the idea that OSHA could technically uh, stop work if there's imminent danger or harm. Um, no, they cannot. Ah. The, OSHA has to go to a federal court to get a shutdown order. And based on recent um, statements by the agency made in a federal court case that Ann referred to under the prior administration, they basically have said that unless an inspector uh, recommends it, OSHA has no authority to even seek that court order. So the OSHA's power is really uh, the individual inspector who sees an imminent danger, their power is to persuade an employer to do something about it quickly, because otherwise the process, it's not easy. It's not like OSHA can go into court the next day and get a shutdown order. And if it's now, imminent. Now MSHA could, but OSHA could not. And I'm wondering if you would like to add to this, especially given the case that um, you had uh, worked on a bit, the, I believe the Made Right case where they sought, uh, they sought assistance, worker, three meatpacking workers sought assistance uh, under right. the concept. So I would, um, and I think that's the case that Randy mentioned. Um, I would say that OSHA stopped taking the position that the um, compliance officer had to disagree with his or her boss about whether there was an imminent danger, but it doesn't matter because the judge accepted that, what one of my colleagues referred to as a cockamamie theory. Um, so we are, um, we are sort of stuck with it. But when OSHA does try, I think the, the last case I was involved in, and it isn't by any means the last case, I don't think, um, was more than 25 years ago and it involved Dayton Tire. Um, and it involved, um, a secretary who I think I'll leave nameless because he sort of grandstanded about the, the case. Um, and we ended up losing in the district court. Um, and it, it, was, it cast a real pall over OSHA trying to use its imminent danger authority in the future. What does happen relatively often, relatively being the operative word there, not necessarily often, is that if there is a particular piece of equipment or situation that presents an imminent danger, a compliance officer will bring that to the attention of the employer and that particular piece of equipment will be taken out of service in the meantime. Um, but no, OSHA does not have really meaningful shutdown authority. It would be better if it did, but it doesn't. Um, and those are the same situations in which it's likely that a worker can refuse to work. But once again, if the employer disciplines that worker, there will have to be a months long investigation by OSHA's whistleblower office. Um, 
followed by litigation in a court of appeals, which means that both the solicitor of labor who will actually try the case and the Department of Justice who has to approve all district court filings have to agree and that it just takes a long time for all of those things to happen. And then federal district court litigation itself takes a very long time. And this is for an imminent danger. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, the imminent danger injunctions may take a little bit less time. Those we, we can do more quickly, but the employee who refuses to do a job that will put her in imminent danger, yes, has years to wait to get reimbursed for that. Well, given our conversation today, there are very many challenges that continue to confront us, but also very many opportunities then to address them. Um, I wanna just thank all of you so much for taking the time um, to speak with us today um, and to share your expertise on what the challenges are and, and what some of the uh, possible reforms are. Um, and then pass it back to Thea. Um, thank you so much, Bernice, and thank you to Peter, Les, uh, Randy and Anne for all of your great presentations and your information. And thanks to all of you who joined us this afternoon for your terrific questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to more of them, but maybe we need another hour and a half at a future date to uh, to do some of that. But um, but I really um, thank you all for being with us and invite you to check out the recording, which will be on our website at epi.org, but also all the other papers that are associated with this project on unequal power, different aspects of unequal power around race and around gender, and around um, uh, workplace institutions and so on that I think you will find interesting. So that's also at epi.org slash unequal power. You can also sign up on our website to receive notices about future events. And I guess I would say also on one note of optimism that we're happy that Ann Rosenthal is gonna be at OSHA. We will look forward to her continued activism and advocacy on these issues of keeping workers safe. And we will um, hope that some of the reforms and the ideas and policies and the enforcement mechanisms that you all have talked about today uh, will be um, at the top of the agenda of this new administration. And Bernice, thank you so much for, for your reporting, for your stories and for your moderation today. So thank you all for joining us and look forward